Welcome to this lecture about the Kalman filter. The Kalman filter was invented in 1960 by Rudolf Kalman and has since been a very important tool in the toolbox of endosense effusion specialists. The filter is important enough to render two lectures in this series. And in this lecture, we'll talk about the Kalman filter itself and a little bit about how to tune it, whereas we'll talk more about properties and other extensions in following uh, clips. The Kalman filter applies to linear state space models. One is shown here. The next state is a linear combination of the current state plus some process noise. The measurements that we expect. That's a linear combination of the current state plus some measurement noise. We assume the covariance of the process noise to be Q and the covariance of the measurement noise to be R. Furthermore, the process and the measurement noise both has uh, zero mean. The process noise can both incorporate errors due to modeling errors and maneuvers, for example, from someone driving something. We will show that a Kalman filter is a solution to the Bayesian uh, filter recursion and it's be, it will be an exact solution in case of Gaussian noise. For your convenience the Bayesian filter recursion is given here. It consists of two parts. It's the prediction step which predicts what happens in the future given the current state incorporates that in the estimate, and the measurement update, which incorporates observations of uh, our object into the state information. We'll see how these can be uh, used to drive the Kalman filter. We'll start to derive the Kalman filter by looking at the time update step. The first thing notice is that an affine transformation of a Gaussian variable is still a Gaussian variable. Hence, we only have to look at the mean and the covariance before and after the update step. We assume that you have the mean of the distribution before the update. So this uh, mean of the state at time k, given all the measurements that we received up until time k, it's x hat k given k, and the matching covariance matrix pk given k. We now start by uh, finding out the mean of the updated distribution. It's simply plugging in the motion model and applying the expectation. We know that the expectation of a constant is a constant, so we can push that through and have the expectation of x given the measurements. So this is x hat k given k. And we know that the mean of the process noise is zero, so this second term disappears. And we end up with this simple expression here. We derive the covariance in a similar fashion. So we plug in the motion model into the covariance expression. We notice that we can push in the covariance. We get four terms of which two are immediately removed. Those that relate to cross correlations between x and v because we said that those should be independent. So we have this guy here that is uh, covariance of uh, f times x, which turns out to be f p f transpose. And then we have a similar term relating to the covariance of the process noise. And this is the updated process noise. So we notice here what happened is that we have a knowledge before, which is then transformed based on the motion that we make. And furthermore, we add some more noise due to uncertainties in the model and in, for example, maneuvers if you're tracking a car. Before we do the measurement update step, we'll review Lemma 7.1, dealt with in a separate module. Uh, in that module, we show that X and Y, if they're jointly distributed Gaussian stochastic variables, we can get a really simple expression for the conditional distribution X given Y. That's given by the expression here. We will use this in the measurement update derivation. Given this, we can compute the measurement update of the Kalman filter. We assume that we have the expected value of x with all the measurements but the current time available, 
that is x hat k given k minus 1, and the matching covariance, that is p k k given k minus 1. That's exactly what we get from the uh, time update step. We now compute the joint distribution of x k and y k, so the data time k and the measurement at time k. We plug in the measurement model here, and then we compute all the relevant means and covariances. The mean of x is straightforward, we know since before, and as with the prediction, uh, the measurement noise is white, so that disappears. So we have h times x for the mean of the measurements. We keep the uncertainty for covariance of the state, and the covariance of the expected measurement is given by a term that relates to how uncertain we are of x, which is included in the expression of the model, and the uncertainty of the measurement itself. If we now apply lemma 7.1, we get the following expressions, which are the Kalman filter measurement updates equations. Next, we will look at uh, the structure of these two equations to try to highlight some properties of it. So here we have the expressions. And if we look here, this is actually the expected measurement that we get if we have the state given here. This is what we expect to measure. This is important enough for us to call it y hat and substitute in. That shows us more clearly that this thing here is actually the difference between the obtained measurement y and our expected measurement y hat. We call this epsilon k, and that's the innovation of the system. That's what includes new information to the Kalman filter. Next, we notice this term here, both in the mean and the covariance expressions. It's actually the covariance of the innovation. We'll call that S. So we can see here that we now have S in both cases. Furthermore, this is actually a linear relation in the measurements. We'll highlight this by calling this part here K, the Kalman filter gain. It appears both in the mean and the covariance expressions. This is a more condensed form of the Kalman filter. Note again that in the prediction step, we expand uncertainty by adding a term to the covariance, whereas in the measurement phase, we cut away uncertainty by introducing measurements. So the covariance is increased during the prediction step and decreased during the measurement update step. Let's look at some fundamental properties of the Kalman filter that are important. First of all, the measurement only affects the value of x hat, so the mean, not the covariance. This means that we can actually compute the covariance beforehand, just using the model without having to know anything about the measurement that we will obtain. This is useful for efficient implementations. Secondly, we haven't shown here, but it can be shown that the Kalman filter is the best linear unbiased estimator, a blue estimator, that one can get for a linear model with any noise with known covariance. Furthermore, if we now assume, as we did here, that the distributions are Gaussian, then this is the exact solution to the Bayesian re recursion for, for, for these models. So this is the optimal Bayesian uh, filter. Another interesting thing to know is that it's possible to formulate this filter in an equivalent way in, for, in terms of the information and the information state. Here, the information state and information. We get a set of equations that look slightly different, but have the same fundamental properties. However, uh, it could sometimes be good to use the information form to highlight certain properties of the filter and to get better implementations. You can read more about the information filter in the textbook. Furthermore, and we'll see more about this in separate modules, 
the common filter only applies to linear systems. Many other systems in the world are actually nonlinear, in which case the Kalman filter does not apply. However, already from the start, people made up approximations that have been really successful in real life. So the extended Kalman filter is one of those, the uncensored Kalman filter is another one. You'll learn more about them later. Now let's look at how to tune the Kalman filter. Given that we actually have an exact model of the system, we can use the covariance of the process noise and the measurement noise as input in this, and we are done. And then we have the optimal filter. However, in practice, this is rarely the case. So we'll have to uh, treat Q and R as uh, tuning parameters instead. Note there is a difference between the Q and the R in the model that we use for the for the filter and the real ones in the actual system in the world. The latter ones we cannot affect, but we can tune the ones in the filter to get the, the behavior that we are looking for. So the important thing for the filter is the ratio Q over R. It tells how fast the filter adapts to changes. The recommendation is to fix R according to sensor specification and what we have measured. It's usually quite easy to derive the uncertainty of the measurements, whereas the Q can be treated as a tuning parameter. The motion model is in most cases anyhow quite uncertain. When doing the tuning, tune in, in large steps, more or less orders of magnitude. Uh, so Q increased by a factor of 10, decrease by a factor of 10, not add uh, 0.5 or something like that. When tuning, if you have high SNR, that gives the filter that's quick to respond to changes and adapt to maneuvers, for example. But this comes at the price of being more noisy. So you get a small bias in your estimates, but you get a large variance uh, instead. On the contrary, uh, tuning the filter to have low SNR gives a slow filter that doesn't adapt to changes or maneuvers that quickly, but uh, has a small uncertainty. So we get a larger uh, bias and a smaller variance. So this is always the trade-offs between filters. Large or small bias versus large or small variance. In this case, P0 reflects the belief in the prior when we start a filter. And if we don't know much about that, we should choose P really large to uh, not impose too much information on the setting. Note that these rules for tuning are valid for most of the Kalman filter-like filters, and for that matter, other filters as well. But the uh, exact expressions are a bit different. That's why we treat them here. But these are the general rules for how to tune a filter in general. Let's have a look at a example of this. So we start with a model that is constant velocity model. We have a measurement of the position. This is in 2D. And we construct a linear state space model from this. Simulate some data and apply the Kalman filter to it. And then plot the result. And we get the thing on the right. Please feel free to play around with the toolbox to get the feeling for how these things work. We can also look at the separate states and their uncertainty, as in this case here. Notice that we are pretty good at estimating the position based on the measurements, which is not so strange because we are actually measuring position, but that we also get some information about the velocity in the model, even though we don't measure any velocities. This is due to the connection between the velocity and this, the position, and we can then uh, push back information to the velocity from the position measurements. To summarize, we have looked at the Kalman filter, one of the most important filters in the toolbox of uh, sensor fusion specialist. It applies to linear models, 
pass the one given up here and can be stated in terms of the two steps, the time update step and the measurement update step with fairly simpler, simple algebraic expressions. To learn more about the Kalman filter, please read uh, section 7 to 7.1 in uh, the textbook. Note that section 7.1.3 is already covered by a separate module. You don't have to read that.